Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Let's open in prayer. God, we thank you that we could come in here and worship you today. Lord, just pray that through all things that you would be glorified. Lord, just pray that your presence, your love, your Holy Spirit would fill this place as we gather in your name. Lord, let us look to you. Just pray that he free us of any distractions this morning as we worship you and as we study your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together and worship in song. the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are to save. He is mighty to save for 
transportation modes to transport the gift boxes to the children. We have canoes, we have what we call a donkey car, and we also have trucks. And then we have humans that are carrying the gift boxes to different places. My name is Grace. I'm the logistics coordinator for Operation Christmas Child Namibia. I am responsible for ensuring that the gift boxes get into the country and into the hands of the children. When the gift boxes arrive at the port, inspection is done by the customs officials. We always prepare prayerfully so that the hearts of the customs officials are kind and soft towards the projects. Once the customs officials clear the gift boxes, then the gift boxes get to be released. Once the gift boxes are released, we load them onto the trucks. The trucks transport the gift boxes to the different regions. The regional teams receive the gift boxes, and that's how the ministry partners receive the gift boxes, and then they get to distribute the gift boxes to the children. So this whole process involves a lot of volunteers, and it involves a lot of dedication. Our prayer request is for the safety of everybody that is involved in transporting the gift boxes, for God to bless them and for them not to give up helping us in this process. Now we come to the part of the service where we pray. So I'll open us up in prayer. And if there's something God's put on your heart, something or somebody that you want to pray for, go ahead and pray it out. I'll give you the opportunity. Let's pray. Lord, today we're grateful that we can just come in here and be together and start up our week praising you and worship, worshiping you and being in your word. Lord, just pray that we would be filled up with your love and with your presence. Lord, just thank you for the answers to prayer that we see. 
especially health-wise, as we pray for many here have been prayed for, for their health, for their, he for their healing, and here they are. Lord, just continue to pray for those that can't be with us today due to sickness and health. Pray for their healing. Just pray that they would be back soon and that we might all be able to be together here. Lord, just pray over our church. Lord, just pray that you'd help us to grow, help us to reach our neighborhood. Lord, there are so many people that don't know you, don't know your forgiveness, and don't know your love. And Lord, I just pray for our church as we've had some conflict. I pray that you bring healing and love to us, that we might move ahead in your power and in your grace. Now I'd like to open up the prayer request to the congregation. God, we thank you for hearing all of our prayers. We thank you that we could give you our worries and our problems, as well as praise you for all the things that you've done for us. Thank you for calling us your sons and daughters. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
I find one of the more interesting features of the Bible to be the way it depicts its many heroes. See, with nearly all of them that we know very much about, it doesn't just tell us the great and mighty things they did through God to work in their lives, but it also shows us their imperfections and their mistakes. Now, it doesn't have to do that. We believe the Bible's inspired by God. Yet, he wanted us to see these things of people's failures, their mistakes and their imperfections. I've wondered why at times, as have you probably, but if all of our heroes of the faith were perfect people, that you know, people that didn't make mistakes, people that had a perfect past, what hope would we have to be able to be used by God and do his work? We might feel like we could never measure up. I mean, think, think about the Bible. Where does it start? In Genesis, God creates heaven and earth in the beginning, makes a garden of paradise, and puts a man and a woman in it. And the first thing we see them do is disobey God and then blame each other. Seems like the first real problem was them failing to take responsibility, saying it was the other person's fault. Really interesting way to start everything, isn't it? Well, and we learn from it. We learn we need to take responsibility for our actions and for our past, but not much has changed. Everybody still likes to blame other people for their shortcomings. We, have, we all have failures, we all have shortcomings. And it seems that there's a tendency to blame your parents, blame your family, blame your having problems at work, blame your boss. I mean, that, that's, that's one of the things. Nothing's ever some people's fault, is it? And then we have Noah, the only righteous person out there, but as soon as he's off the ark, he's having an alcohol, a drunkenness issue, and wandering off unclothed. Next big hero of the faith is Abraham. He, uh, he was afraid of Pharaoh and offering to share his wife with her. Very strange. Um, Joseph, big thinker, liked to brag, was big into dream interpretation and had a prison record. <laughs> Moses, a modest and meek man, had a real temper that got the better of him a few times, didn't want to do what God asked him to do, but ask God to pick somebody else. He had uh, fled Egypt over a murder charge, yet one of the great heroes of our faith, David, maybe the most promising leader yet in the Bible if you're reading through it, yet he not only had an affair with his one of his soldiers' wives, but had him murdered so he could take her for himself, yet was still called the man after God's own heart in the end. Solomon, all those wives. I mean, the Bible doesn't say that was a sin. You have to wonder, but having this great wisdom and having more than one wife, I just don't understand. He followed after other gods as well. Elijah collapsed under pressure, prone to depression. Hosea 
didn't seem to do too bad himself, but well, most, most of us have a hard time getting past his wife's occupation. <laughs> Jonah, God told him to do something and he did the opposite. God told him go to Nineveh, he quickly headed in the other direction. He became very angry and mad at God because God wasn't going to destroy a, pe a city killing thousands of people. And then we have Paul. Paul, formerly known as Saul, murdered Stephen, one of the first one of the first deacons. Quite a pass. And then we come to Peter. And I believe God puts these in here for a reason. Peter, in Luke chapter twenty two, Peter, as we just talked about. Jesus had said, one of you is going to betray me. And Peter said, not I. Uh, he told Jesus he'd fight for him and even die for him. And I think he was serious. Remember when Jesus was being arrested at night, Peter drew a sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. His name was Malchus. And we see Jesus picking the ear back up and putting it on, healing him. We wonder what they didn't arrest Peter. They didn't arrest Peter for assaulting an officer. It's kind of hard to make the charges stick if the ear's there and there's no injury. Hey, you're willing to draw the sword and fight with the soldiers coming to arrest him? He was. Seems he was serious. Seems like he was willing to die. And as I mentioned too, being able to cut somebody's ear off, it's either some sort of astronomical winning the lottery kind of luck, or you're a master swordsman. One or the other. You decide which. And then Jesus is arrested and taken. Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Pick up where we left off. Then seizing him, they led him away to the house of the high priest. So they arrest Jesus at night, and they take him to the house of the high priest. Why there? Why not the temple? Well, it's the middle of the night. They were afraid to deal with Jesus in the temple because Jesus had the crowds with him. The people were following him, Jesus had, for all practical purposes, taken over the temple. He had more authority there than the high priest and the rest of them. It said that they wanted to arrest him there, but they were afraid because of the crowds. So now they're doing underhanded things, and they're doing it in secret. They arrest him at night. They take him to the house of the high priest. So he's beginning to be questioned. It says, Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat, sat down together, Peter sat down with him. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. Now remember, Jesus had said to Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, you'll have denied me three times. It seemed that Peter could hardly believe it. One interesting thing in the text, this is in all four Gospels. This accounts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But none of them say why Peter denied Jesus. I think we usually assume it's because he's scared. Was he afraid? I think most people assume he was afraid that he was going to be arrested and 
tried and crucified along with Jesus. Yet, I'm not sure if that fits or not. We don't really know. He said he was willing to follow Jesus even unto death. Was he afraid? It doesn't seem to be in character for him. He's impulsive. He's always the first to volunteer and step forward. He's always the first one with an answer, even though sometimes he gets it wrong when Jesus is asking the disciples questions. Well, let's consider. He could have been afraid and thus preserving his own life. You see, I don't think God wanted him to be crucified along with Jesus. God's plan for him was to go and lead the church afterwards. Maybe he was afraid. After all, he would, but he was the only one to draw his sword and attack. The rest of the disciples didn't. Or was he disappointed in Jesus? Some, some have speculated he may have been disappointed in Jesus. Jesus could have fought back. Jesus had said to them, I'm going, I'm going with you willingly. He said he could have asked the Father who would have sent legions of angels to fight for him. Peter certainly would have believed that. But Jesus kept talking about his death, that he has to suffer and die. Earlier, Peter rebuked him for that. Peter rebuked Jesus. Hard to imagine Peter rebuking Jesus, yet he could have been a bit fed up like, Jesus, you don't have to go with them. Jesus, you don't have to die. Why are you letting them do this to you? It might have made him angry. That's definitely a possibility. Or was he saying he didn't know Jesus? Some have said he might have been telling this white lie, so to speak, in order to try to find a way to rescue Jesus and bail him out. He might have been there looking for an opportunity to attack or jump in. Yet, it says, Peter followed at a distance. And then he's there, sitting in the courtyard outside the house of the high priest. Ask yourselves, where were all the other disciples? Were they there with him? It seems as we read the account, it doesn't say for sure, but it seems that Peter was the only one that had the guts to follow him and to go there and to be with Jesus. That, that took nerve. That was risky. Was he spying and reporting back to the others? Did they scatter? Was, was Peter trying to do reconnaissance? Was he thinking about a rescue mission? Maybe. These are all possibilities. I'm trying to picture what this looked like. The house of the high priest and there's a courtyard outside with the fire and there's people sitting around the fire and Peter goes, sits down with them and joins them thinking, Nobody's going to notice him. Must have, been, must have been a few other people there as they're having a fire there to keep warm. A servant girl recognizes him and says, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little while later, someone else saw him and said, you also were one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. Peter uses man. Some, one of the lexicons when I was looking at this said it was an expletive, can, or can be used as an expletive, saying man. King James version of this account in the other Gospels says that this, Peter swore, 
and cursed, saying, I don't know him. Seems that it's getting, it's getting on his nerves and getting under his skin. About an hour later, so first a servant girl asks him, then another asks him, and then about an hour after that, I mean, Peter, if he was afraid, he could have run off. He could have run off by now. He's sitting there a while, trying to see you in the door. One of the accounts, um, as I was looking at this in Greek, it said that the door, the keeper of the door, so you could assume Peter's trying to look in and see what's going on in there with Jesus. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow is with him, for he is a Galilean. How do they know? Maybe they've seen him. Maybe they've seen him with Jesus. Here he picks up that he's a Galilean. A lot of the time you know where somebody's from because of their accent, because of the way they talk. For he is a Galilean, that being from Galilee. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. What do you think the look was? Anger? Compassion? Disappointment? We can only imagine. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. It seemed that in that moment, he remembered what Jesus had said, that you're going to deny me three times. Before the rooster crows, Peter must have forgotten it up to this point, not realizing what he was doing, just being caught up in the moment. But then Jesus looked straight at him, and that rooster crows, and he went outside and wept bitterly, realizing that he had failed Jesus right here. And then it says, the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, pro demanded, prophesy who hit you. And they said many other insulting things to him. Now this is just a picture of the worst of humanity. Jesus who taught goodness and love, among other things, never, never sinned, never made a mistake. They're playing a cruel game with him blindfolding him and hitting him, saying, tell us who hit you if you're a prophet, prophesy who hit you, saying many things, hurling insults at him. Now, what was wrong with these men that were the men that were guarding him? They're bored. They're cruel. This is, they've been up all night. The rooster crows at first light. They have nothing better to do than to be Jesus. And then in Luke's gospel, as we go through it, we have Peter deny Jesus, Jesus be put on trial, Jesus crucified and resurrected, and then giving some final instructions to his disciples. We have to, we turn over to John to see the restoration of Peter. It'd be a shame if the story ends here and Peter just decides he's not a disciple anymore. He's let Jesus down and there's no redemption. No, he becomes a great leader in the early church, ultimately becoming bishop or overseer of the church in Rome. John 21 
has the resurrected Jesus, John 21, 15 tells the rest of the story. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, they have breakfast on the shore here. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. So Jesus hadn't really had a one-on-one -on -one with Peter or dealt with this since the denial of Jesus. Or not just one denial, the three denials of Jesus. And now Jesus is confronting him. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And there's a thing in the original languages here. There's different words for love. It's here, do you agape me? That's a godly, self selfless love. A pure love. Peter, of course. Peter's probably wondering, why is Jesus asking me this? Oh, he's asking me this because I denied knowing him. He's making sure that I, I still love him. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to them, take care of my sheep. Now, as far as we know, Jesus didn't leave a pen of lambs behind. The sheep, the sheep, and you probably all already know this, the sheep are his followers, his people. We are the sheep, he is the shepherd. So Jesus is saying to him, take care of my church, take care of my people, take care of my followers. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Now, one thing we lose in translation here, we have that word for godly, perfect, abiding love. Do you agape me? Yes, you know that I got you. And then he, he asked him that twice. And then the third time, it's do you phileo me? Phileo, brotherly love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Easy to remember. But it's a, it's a lesser word. If I were doing the translation, it would be a little closer to this. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Peter, do you even like me? That's, that's more of how it reads. Like, Peter, or brotherly love is more of a friendship. Peter, are we friends? Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Peter, are we even friends? Are we friends? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. I think the hurt came from the change in language. Like, Jesus has already asked me this twice. If you keep asking somebody the same question over and over, it might be because you don't believe them. Or Peter, do you even like me? Peter, are we friends? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Why did Jesus ask him a third time? Well, pretty simple. He denied him not once, not twice, but three times. Jesus is going to ask him, do you love me three times? Jesus was making a point. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, Peter, in this passage in Luke, this paragraph is, seems like the focus shifts from Jesus to Peter. 
And then Peter becomes a very dominant leader in the early church. Um, some in the Episcopalian, Catholic, Apostolic Succession churches. Peter's the Bishop of Rome and the first Pope with a long succession into the present day. Now, all, yet all four Gospels are sure to include this account of him denying Jesus and making this very embarrassing mistake. Gospel of Mark even has it. Gospel of Mark tradition has that Mark was Peter's scribe and wrote the Gospel as Peter dictated it to him, telling the story of Jesus and Mark's the earliest Gospel. So if you could call the Gospel of Mark the Gospel of Peter just as well, I suppose. And in that Gospel, he puts this account. So Peter chooses to tell this, chooses to make it public. And they say that Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source because some of the wording's exactly the same, yet went on to tell more of their own stories about Jesus. And all of it's God breathed and moved and inspired by God to be in there. So if you could see that this preeminent apostle in here making this mistake, being forgiven and restored by Jesus, that gives the rest of us a whole lot of hope. We've all made mistakes. We've all done things we're not proud of. We all need God's forgiveness. Yet, this seems like a big deal to deny knowing Jesus when he's trained you all this time and he's done everything for, everything for Peter. Yet, it's in here to show us something. It's here to show us God's forgiveness. And that the principle to never think that God can't or won't use you because of something in your past that you're not proud of. Very, very encouraging here. I hope when you read your Bible, you can appreciate when it points out the flaws. As some say, it shows us our heroes, warts and all. You can appreciate why it's in there to give us hope to be able to be disciples of Jesus as well. Give us hope to be able to be used by God. That we don't have to be perfect people for God to do something with our lives. Jesus goes on in John, he says, feed my sheep. And then he says to Peter, very truly I tell you, when you were younger you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. What does that mean? Somebody else is going to dress you and lead you where you don't want to go? Is he in the nursing home? No, it says, verse 19, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Ten of the apostles were martyrs, killed for their faith. Now, that's important because there were people right after the resurrection of Jesus claiming the disciples, the Sanhedrin claimed the disciples stole his body. That was their story and they're sticking to it. Yet, the Sanhedrin were the ones that put Jesus on trial and had him crucified by the Romans. They made sure to have Roman guards posted to guard Jesus' tomb. If you failed in your guard duty as a Roman, 
a soldier in the Roman military, you were executed. We have historical documents from Roman history that say that. You let your prisoners go, they escape, you're executed. I mean, they didn't mess around. And the Sanhedrin had Jesus crucified. The Sanhedrin had Jesus' tomb guarded. The Sanhedrin took charge of Jesus' body. Joseph of Arimathea that took Jesus' body and had it buried was a member of the Sanhedrin. And then the Sanhedrin comes out and claimed Jesus, Jesus' disciples stole his body somehow. And then... They stick to that story, and then 10 of them are martyred for their faith. Um, Judas goes off and hangs himself after betraying Jesus. John lives to a ripe old age. John's the only one to die of old age. The rest of them are put to death for saying Jesus rose from the dead. They paid for it with their lives. That's one way that one, that's some strong evidence to say that the resurrection happened. So he's saying, saying this to Peter to indicate what kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Peter was arrested and put on trial and ordered to be crucified in Rome. And yet, he said he didn't feel worthy to die in the same manner as Jesus, so he asked that he be crucified upside down. So Peter was crucified upside down, bearing witness and sealing his testimony. Jesus was preparing him for that. And then he said to him, follow me. Here Peter is reinstated. He's confirmed again as a disciple of Jesus. Jesus gives him the commission, follow me. When Jesus first called Peter his disciple, same words, follow me, come be my disciple. It's the call of discipleship once again. Peter is restored by Jesus. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them, that's beloved disciple in John's gospel. That's the apostle John. So Peter, James, and John are the inner circle. He looks at John and says, well, what about him? Jesus tells him of the kind of death he's going to die, and Peter says, what about him? Well, Peter couldn't see the future, but if... Peter gets to be crucified upside down, but John gets to be um, gets to live his life to a ripe old age. We would say that's not fair. It's not fair, is it? That's that seems to be what Peter was going for. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the Last Supper and said, "Lord, who is going to betray you?" When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus didn't say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You know what that says to us? You know what he's, Jesus was saying to Peter? You do what I called you to do. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. And that comes over quite well to us. Kids are really good at this. Well, what about him? What about her? Snacks with fast kids. He got, how come he got a barbecue chip bag and I got Cheetos? That's, that's not fair. The barbecue chips have become the coveted, <laughs> the coveted snack. <laughs> I told Debbie and she, she went and bought a whole box of just barbecue chips. 
Is that that seems to be what it is? But we see we see even when snacks are passed out. What about him? If you had kids, you know this when you assign chores. How come this one, how come my brother or sister got an easier chore than I did? It's not fair. We do the, I mean, kids, we do this as adults. How come she got the promotion and I didn't? How come he got a better office than me? You know, we do these. Jesus is saying, worry about what I asked you to do. Don't be comparing yourself to everybody else and worrying about what I asked them to do. See, in the Bible, God gives different people different jobs. In the New Testament, Paul explains it very well with spiritual gifts saying God gives different people different gifts to be used to bless others in the community of believers and in the church. You use your gifts. Don't. The body needs all its parts to be able to function and work together. Don't, don't worry about what somebody else got just because you want it. You worry about what I asked you to do. And that's all. Peter's restored. Boy, kind of a kind of a sad and hard story with Peter denying Jesus. Yet it doesn't end there. We see at the end Jesus forgives him. Jesus restores him. Jesus makes him a disciple again. Jesus says Jesus' wish for him is feed my lambs, meaning take care of my people or take care of my church. That's, that's what he had for Peter to do. Take care of my church. Take care of my people. And don't, don't worry about what John gets. We have, to, we have to all take this to heart. Don't worry about somebody else's spiritual gifts. Worry about your spiritual gift. Don't worry about what God's calling other people to, worry about what God calls you to do and expects you to do. Don't compare. Comparison's the root of all kinds of unhappiness. But between you and God, you know what God wants you to do? And do it. Simple as that. Now, uh, as we end, like to invite the worship team up for a final song. And as always, if you'd like to come forward for any prayer, I'll be at the front during the last song. Can you stand with me, please?
Well, now we'll have a few announcements and be dismissed. Reminder that there are Connect cards in the back of each chair. If you'd like to put your contact information to be on the, the mailing list to get our newsletter or to write down a prayer request if you have something you'd like us to be praying for. Also reminder that you could still give online by bank bill pay or by mail if you wish. Um, this week, uh, Linda Schindler, my mom's out of town, so there won't be an exercise class tomorrow, Monday at 10 a.m. as we normally have each week. Tuesday and Thursday after school, 2.30 to 4.30, fast kids. Tuesday, middle school, and Thursday for elementary school. Please let me or Mary Sutter know if you're able to help with that. Girls game night's coming up this Thursday, November 7th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, and another girls game gathering later in the month, Thursday, November 21st at 11 a.m. The Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are due back today. Um, if you forgot them for any reason, you could check in with Debbie or Dolores about what to do. Um, Sunday, mark your calendar, Sunday, November 24th, is our Thanksgiving dinner at 4 p.m. here. And there's a sign-up sheet on the back if you'd like to sign up to bring a dish. Um, Dolores has organized a lunch today after church at El, El Portal Mexican restaurant. It's just down the road behind Burger King if you'd like to join lunch. Um, also, there's been a petition for a special meeting for a vote of confidence for your pastor, November 17th at noon. And it's paperwork on the back table. We'll also be doing a vote of confidence for Mike Turner as a deacon. Um, with that, I'd like to invite everybody to rise for the benediction and we'll be dismissed. Okay, Dolores had just said that uh, she will be happy to walk you through the process of doing a shoebox online if you still want to do one. You could do one online without having to go shopping and buy items. So talk to Dolores if you want to do that. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.